So far, we have published a dozen of episodes for the VLSI freshers. These includes VLSI ecosystem, VLSI job domains, various VLSI engineering roles, freshers CTC and increment rate with allied conditions. We have also spoken about the basic do's and don'ts, career guidance choice between front-end versus back-end, how to get VLSI internships and deal with job application blues and many more. We have done futuristic prediction about artificial intelligence taking over the VLSI arena. We have packed all these necessary videos into this single marathon episode by digitally remastering the audio. So stay tuned, stay focused. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Q&A. In today's episode, we'll discuss a question from our viewer Uday, who has asked that I am an undergraduate and what things I need to learn to enter into the VLSI. So today we'll focus on this question and its answer. So watch till the end to know the detailed answer. Uday's question is a very good question and it's a very wide question. So it's simple one line question, but the answer is not really a one line. So first of all, I would like to suggest the boys and girls who are undergraduate, right? They should at least do their coursework good so their academic score is good. That is the first thing you have to do. There is no compromise on it. Next thing, when you want to enter into the VLSI, right? There are lots of things you can learn extra. Now, two broader categories of designing in a VLSI. One is digital electronics. Second is analog electronics. And there is a third, which is analog mixed signal electronics. So I'll cover all the three things in today's episode. If you are good at digital electronics and uh, you love all the logic gates and the staffs uh, during your course. Okay. So that time I'll suggest that there are two branches you can go ahead based on your inclination. Okay. First thing is that if you are inclined uh, towards the programming, coding, etc., you can go towards the front end. Next, if you are a much more inclined towards the process of making a semiconductor device like stick diagram etc all these stuffs then you can go for the back end now i'll come into the detail so let's start with the front end part so in front end you have to do the verification that is basically your hdl and it requires additional programming and etc different scripting language to incorporate the test benches and all so if you are keen towards the programming side and coding side whether it, it is hdl or it is scripting or any programming language it's better you go towards the front end part so in that that direction you can learn Perl, Python as a scripting language, Ruby, another one. Another thing, if you want to learn the HDL, Verilog, VHDL, Verilog AMS, VHDL AMS, all these stuffs you can learn. And once you are done with that, you can go to the next level with the system Verilog. And then another level up, you can go with the UVM, OVM, all these verification methodologies. Okay, these are by Accelera. And if you go to the documentation, you can learn them. This is for the front end part. Now, if you are keen towards the process of making a semiconductor device, stick diagram, layout, etc so you can go towards the back end in back end you have to learn about the layout the physical verification the extraction the timing that is static timing analysis lec all those stuff so based on your nature of inclination you can choose if you are keen to stay on digital electronics you can choose first to the front end or uh, towards the back end okay so based on your interest area basically you have to survive for a long long time and it's better that you choose the direction on which you are basically naturally inclined now these two things on a digital electronic parts it's done so i'm moving towards the next topic that is analog electronic now analog electronics is a particular subject that you learn throughout your course and maybe you are keen towards like uh, learning about op amps oscillators dlls all these stuffs all their mathematical equation and all so if your natural inclination is towards that way you could be a good candidate for the analog design and analog verification so for that from your coursework you must learn the spice language uh, there are a lot of free tools spice tutorial will come so you can wait for that and there are other stuffs like they basics like circuit theory and KCLK will all those stuffs are there so you must learn them in a very good fashion and uh, there is another good uh, tool a uh, free tool is there LT Spice where you can draw the schematics and uh, from there you can simulate and there is also other tools also I'll come up so this is a brief description so I'll say that for analog electronics you have to learn all these things and uh, you can go on there is no end of learning once you start learning you, you will keep on exploring every time if you explore 100 meters of your yard then you can see the next 100 yard this way you probably 
proceed with your knowledge and go in the broader direction now these all these two broader categories that is digital and analog electronics i have already discussed the next point comes is the analog mix signal electronics nowadays you know guys that we are hitting almost the 5 nanometer node or so at this node there is a very very little chance to go further down entire vlsi industry now stretching towards the mixture of digital and analog electronics so that is called analog mix signal electronics so there are two parts one is the designing another is the verification so they are both your analog as well as the digital skills are needed so if you are a person who have your keenness towards both digital as well as the analog electronics you can jump for this field so this is the kind of uh, detailed answer that would i ask this vlsi world is a continuously evolving sector and there is a lot of knowledge that is coming through so you must also subscribe to all the semiconductor news forum spread across the internet so that you can get updates what is going here and there and what is the latest technology that is coming in all these things are very very needed i will emphasize again your coursework is the main thing where your academic score you have to score it good so that you have your threshold cross at the very beginning of your interview anywhere so that's all for today i have discussed in detail Welcome friends, in today's video we are going to discuss about the bird's eye view of the VLSI ecosystem. Bird's eye view means whatever we can see from the top level. Let's begin. Here in this particular video do not require any kind of prerequisite. Absolutely a uh, newbie can watch this video. So here this is what I am going to say about the VLSI ecosystem. What companies are there and how they function, how they interact. So here you can see lot of encircled names like Fab, Chip Design House, EDA Tool Manufacturer, Services Companies, IP Design House, Post Silicon Validation Companies and there are a lot of arrows going from one direction to another direction. So this means that these uh, things are well interconnected. Okay, so let's begin. We say it is a fab and also we say it is a foundry. What a foundry does? So fabrication house a foundry, it physically fabricates the semiconductor chips from various fabless design houses. It also provides the device level models to the design house or the IP manufacturers. Primarily as a file, they provide tech files, design rule document containing the DRC, also various metal via details, design constraint, the PDKs. So fabrication house, they manufacture the IC on top of the silicon. Let's move on to the next section, IP design house. IP design house is uh, connected to the fab because when you order the PDK from the foundry, you also need the compatible IPs to use in your design, whether you are doing an analog or a digital design, any type of. So IP design house is what uh, they make. They manufacture different type of IPs like analog, digital, mixed signal, IPs broadly if it is a digital it will contain the logic families high speed interface IPs also a chip needs memory so there will be memory flash flash memory SRAM memory Bitcoin IPs are nowadays very much uh, popular also because of the Bitcoin mines for a chip to be fabricated also IO PLL PLL acts sometimes acts as a clock BCD IPs networking IPs also needed automotive IPs are now in a high tide because the automobile they also use a lot of electronic gadgets inside them so it is kind of a uh, hot kick nowadays ip design houses i mix the ips in a different format so either they can uh, supply the soft ips or the hard ips mostly it is hard ip or in between there could be a farm ip also these ip design houses also have a unit who usually makes the one test chip where the different combinations of their ip whatever they manufacture are used to check the functionality at the silicon so they go up to the silicon also the silicon actually made in the fab but this is done there also the next block here is the chip design houses what they do so if it is a digital chip they will make uh, the soc from rtl to the gds2 if it is an analog company they will start their design with the schematic and they will go to layout and finally they stream out to gds2 the design if it is a mixed signal then they will combine both the RTL as well as the schematic at the beginning for their digital and the analog block combining mix signal flow will continue up to the GDS2 and also the FPGA companies they will also design FPGAs the next companies are EDA tool manufacturer these manufacturer do they make the softwares for the various parts of the design process 
we cannot do it by hand so we have to do it by software whatever design say if we make the rtl we have to write the rtl in some of the softwares and verify them whatever they are so broadly categorized these tools are like verification synthesis pnr physical verification once the layout is done timing extraction layout drc tools if it is analog then it will be spice analog layout analog verification tools if there are mixed signal designs they will use the mixed signal verification tools so these companies eda tool manufacturers these are called also product companies because they sell the software product and they sell software as well as corresponding application engineering services to their client next particular set of companies are services companies so these companies do what they have a set of manpower of various kinds it could be verification it could be analog ip design it could be layout experts okay so based on the projects whatever they get from different chip design houses they sell their manpower to that company and because we'll keep a reservoir of people who are expertise in different domains and those people will cater services to the chip design houses for the particular project maybe it could be one particular soc from beginning to end or it could be some ip design also so these companies do not make any products rather their strength is the people who are working there and they sell their people's expertise to the other companies let's move to the next section so here are some more words for these companies like uh, they provide skilled manpower to the chip design house ip design house post silicon design house so post silicon design is uh, also needed because once the chip comes down to the silicon people has to test it provide project based design services means whatever just i just talked about that one particular ic is designed or the soc is designed from the beginning to the end so that will need a people a dedicated team to work on that so that is provide the odc offshore development center where the, say maybe the services company is in a different country and the product company from whom they are working in a different company so they set up a odc in the company where the services company are and that odc will function only for that particular product company so this is a kind of odc model so the post silicon validation company now summing up all together these things the chip is designed when it is done it goes to the fab and fab manufactures in silicon it comes back to the chip design house so the post silicon validation companies it could be inside the chip design company or it could be a separate outside company so they what will do that once the silicon is meant they will make the test chip test chips they are will validate through the physical and electronic verification system so they will be physically verified and they will be compared to the software testing which has been done before the tape out and um, so there are multiple things will be compared as for the stimulus they will be compared against the statistical simulated values like monte carlo or something silicon yield is another factor these companies have to analyze obviously when we are making a chip it will have some frequency and that particular frequency of operation is also checked there the chip because of the process variation temperature and voltage there will be various uh, kind of chips and operating conditions this in also will be verified by these companies and uh, finally once all the testings are done so they will generate the silicon report for that particular chip which you call a test chip so guys here the whole bird's eye view has been given to you and you can see all together different types of companies how they function and how they interact among each other you must have heard the famous quote a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step that's so true our today's episode is about that very first step we have already made video on choosing between front end or back end preparation for vlsi interview etc what about that phase when a student has just joined an engineering college and wants to know about vlsi how would he start how would he proceed our today's episode is on that so stay tuned till the end of the video at the very beginning let me share a real life story me and mridul we come from suburb of kolkata and where we live not many people are really aware of our domain of specialization it is quite a popular term although vlsi or eda need some introduction we always refer to a smartphone and say it's the domain where chip is designed so many people can relate them in a recent gathering of ganpati utsav in our locality we said that what we do and the first year engineering student who was also present there asked us how to start after talking to her we realized that we need to address this point so we came up with this video how to start the first point is 
start with what you have the worst c of vlsi or eda consists of droplets of semiconductor so very basic is with you your textbook understand semiconductor its physics how it works then basic devices diode transistor mosfet all you need to know all the devices that you read in your textbook are fabricated in real chip so if you know them well it's great you have taken very first step successfully number 2 understand the mapping what you read in textbook and what a vlsi engineer does in industry are absolutely related although it seems both are disjoint try to understand the mapping for broader picture if base is strong the structure will stand there for years number 3 understand the requirements you must understand the requirements of the industry requirements means technical and non technical both understanding electronics is the technical requirement and we will discuss this in detail the non technical requirements are problem solving mindset thinking out of the box learning attitude working in a group mindset and corporate work pressure handling problem solving mindset problem solving attitude is the most desirable quality for this industry every morning when you reach your desk expect some new bug is there some tool has failed and your manager expect an answer from you before lunch if you enjoy this problem solving situation under pressure on almost daily basis then you are fit for this industry thinking out of the box not all problems are known many times out of the box thinking will lead you to desired result so try to think differently learning attitude vlsi is a very dynamic domain you always need to learn new things if that is okay with you then great number 4 working in a group mindset step out is a group effort don't ask for personal fame the different vlsi teams work together and exchange ideas for any known or unknown design challenge leading to a seamless chip design flow number 5 corporate work pressure handling corporate job has good reward challenge and dense work pressure ask yourself whether you are truly interested to handle this work pressure for few decades self talk is necessary ask these questions yourself because it's always should be you before you leave after non technical preparation now start your technical preparation you are interested in core electronics and understand the prerequisite of joining vlsi domain so let's move to technical requirement you need to know CMOS fundamentals, EDA tools, Verilog or VHDL, scripting languages, semiconductor fabrication process, static timing analysis, Linux or Unix basic commands. CMOS fundamentals. Your CMOS fundamentals must be very clear. Any standard book will help you. Online materials are also available. Number 2, EDA tools. Commercial tools are super expensive. You cannot afford to have them for practice. Free and open source tools are there to help you out. Such tools are very popular among VLSI freshers. Which tool is used for which purpose you need to know? We have already covered this topic in a video. Link is mentioned in the description of the video. Number 3, Verilog or VHDL. VHDL. Any hardware description language like Verilog or VHDL, you need to know. We have created course on Verilog, and we have exemplified with two different free VLSI tools, namely Vivado and Icarus Verilog, for both Windows and Linux operating systems. Number four, scripting language. Scripting language like Tickle, Perl, Bash, Python is required in day-to-day -day work, both for backend and frontend jobs. There are lots of material available online. In our channel, we have already have complete course for Tickle, Perl. bash links are mentioned in the description box of this video you can find them from playlist page also one more thing to be mentioned here all the full length courses are free of cost and as per industry standard which we take care number 5 is semiconductor fabrication process Semiconductor fabrication process is part of your syllabus. Read it thoroughly and carefully. Number 6, static timing analysis. STA or static timing analysis is the most important topic to write the gigahertz to terahertz speed improvement of upcoming processors. We have covered the theory and hands-on practical sessions using OpenTimer VLSI tool. This tool is a free one. and the download and installation is demonstrated in a single video find the entire sta course in playlist page number 7 linux or unix in the world of vlsi you cannot proceed or progress without learning unix or linux basic unix commands are required materials are available online we have a detailed series also from installation of ubuntu in your existing windows operating systems up to the command line usage through practical sessions are covered link is provided in the description box on pre Preparation part we have already made one video with more detailing you can refer to that video link is provided in the description box 
facts of this video. Now, gather domain knowledge. Gather domain knowledge. There are so many ways to do so. Number one, free materials. You can find lots of free materials online. Read them. Number two, NPTEL content. NPTEL contents are really very good. During our tenure in the industry, we used to watch them for better understanding of fundamentals. Take Simplified TV. We have quite a good collection of topics covered. Many in-depth series are there. Watch them. They are absolutely free. Individual topics are covered in Q&A or FAQ series. Those who are supercharged for VLSI career, we have recently introduced another series called R&D. Watch it. Next, online courses. There are so many online paid courses if you can afford, join them, project or internship. Industrial project or internship will give you a glimpse of real corporate world. This experience will help you to get jobs later. How to find the internship? We have a Q&A video. Link is provided in the description. Webinars. Attend free webinars that are conducted by the expert or professors. You will learn a lot from the webinar because they will share their experience. And final is start to look into different job profiles. That will give you a good idea idea about positions and their requirements. PLSA or EDA is a vast and dynamic domain. If you have decided to pursue career in this domain, be prepared for learning new things on almost daily basis. We have tried to show you many ways of gathering knowledge. Which one you choose depends on your inclination, convenience and time in hand. Always remember you don't have to be great to start but you have to start with mm -hmm. So take the first step, preparation, persistence and perspiration will take you to your desired domain, job or company. Hope this video will help you. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of QA. This episode is a very quick episode I am making. This episode based on a question from one of the subscribers of my channel, Surbi, who was asking that how to get an internship. And this is not the question of Surbi, and this is the question of all the undergraduates who are in the electrical and EC domain. And in this video, I'm going to show you that without any personal connection, how you can apply to the internship. And many of the you have a misconception that all the companies have to come to your campus and take you as an internship known which is not the right concept and uh, here i'm going to show you how you can get uh, your internship so today i'll use my linkedin account to show you how you can search for the internship position so here i have clicked on the jobs tab here there are several tabs so once you log in you will be initially in the phone tab and you can navigate to the job step by clicking here so i am in the job step here i will search for analog design now you can see that so many jobs have opened now how you can go to the internship here if you go in the job type there are several uh, filters are in here these are filter tabs and if you go in the job type you will find one particular checkbox for internship now if i click it and i apply this filter let us see what happens so you can see here in today's date it is showing a lot of lot of internship positions and linkedin why i am choosing this example because in linkedin you can find various internship from multiple companies here you can see that a lot of companies are there and one more thing here if you have your cv ready or the resume or your biodata ready you can directly use the linkedin easy apply it is very very easy just if you click and you attach your resume and you go on okay i'm cancelling it because i am not applying this card and this is a very good uh, and easy method of applying to linkedin positions this is a very good option and uh, in case there is no such option if you click on the apply it will take you to the company's respective website and there you have to create a login id and password and apply so these are the basic things that you have to do so you cannot skip all these steps and uh, just uh, have a shortcut to get into a position of internship now you can see here there are several companies uh, like here it is seagate the next is global foundries there are lots of lots of companies are here. You can search. Now, if I change the search term here, analog design to digital design. This is another key factor that whatever search term you are giving, so you must be very much aware in which field you want to work. So 
in case you do not know that i have also created a video on that in the q a track i give the link in the description so you can go from there now here if you go you can see once i change the keyword from analog to digital you can see here lot of lot of various new positions are coming here so you can see here offices is there sk hynix is there and lot of other companies are here so now if i change the keyword again to memory design so now again more other options are coming so this keyword thing is very very important so when you are searching with a particular keyword your head must be very very clear that which keywords i need to apply in which domain i need to apply for that you need to list out the keywords first before hitting your search engine this will help you to get into the right position so you can see that lot of internship positions are open and you can apply to them so guys this is a short video and uh, i will conclude here when you are applying to lot of positions generally your expectation is that every position i am applying it will give me a return or people will call back or come back to me when uh, you apply to a position you think from another angle that when you are applying to a position that position must be filled up with lots of lots of cvs so the hr or the hiring manager for that post has to also scrutinize once there is a sufficient amount of cv has been gathered now if you are expecting that i am applying today and the tomorrow i'll get a call it's a very very too much optimistic thinking and you must not be very much pessimistic also that okay i'm applying and not getting so that i'll i'll not get anything so this pessimistic and optimistic thoughts are a kind of digital electronics either you have one state or zero state so just change your thought into an analog one which is a realistic one okay if i am applying to 100 attempts uh, the five percent will come back to me so this kind of this is a kind of thumb rule when you apply to any position over the internet across any job site now this five percent may be spread over the entire time when you are applying this may come back or at some point concentrate and this five percent may come back to you so you must be ready to face those on interviews and on so that you get the right position you and the hiring manager they gel with in a right direction so Thank you for watching. During one of our live sessions, a viewer asked a question that which one is better for career growth, front-end or back-end? If you are an EDI or VLSI aspirant and not sure which domain in VLSI would be best suited with your inclination, this video is just for you. Watched in the end of the video. In VLSI design, either we try to address an existing problem or explore some opportunity by transforming a specification into a circuit designed on silicon. The VLSI design flow can be divided into two major parts, front-end and back-end flow. Both together allow the creation of a functional chip from a spec or specification to production. The front-end flow is used to transform the specification or the behavioral description into a RTL circuit description. The major steps of front-end flow are design specification, high-level design, low-level design, HDL or RTL coding, synthesis, DFT, pre-layout, static timing analysis. Design specification. This is the first stage in the design process where we define the important parameters of the system that has to be designed on a specification. High-level design. In this stage, various details of the design architecture are defined. In this stage, details about different functional blocks and interface communication protocols between them, etc. are defined. Next come low level design in this phase lower level design details about each functional block implementation are designed this can include details like module state machines counters marks decoders internal registers etc next is rtl coding in rtl coding phase the micro design is modeled in a hardware description language like verilog or vhdl using synthesizable constructs of the language. Synthesizable constructs are used so that the RTL model can be input to a synthesis tool to map the design to actual gate level implementation later. Next come functional verification. This is the process of verifying the functional characteristic of the design by generating different input stimulus and checking for correct behavior of the design implementation. The next step is logic synthesis. Synthesis is the process in which a synthesis tool like design compiler takes in the RTL target technology 
and constraint as inputs and map the RTL to target technology primitives. Functional equivalent checks are also done after synthesis to check for equivalence between the input RTL model and the output gate level model. Next, DFT that is designed for testability. This is the step where extra logic is put in the normal design so that the design become testable in post-production. Post-production testing is absolutely necessary because the process of manufacturing is not 100% error free. And then comes pre-layout static timing analysis. In this stage, timing checks are done with synthesized gate level netlist and wear load delay model. This timing analysis acts as a preventive measure before we do the actual STA at the post layout level. As a front end engineer, one could start as an RTL design engineer or a verification engineer and gain deeper knowledge and skills as they progress in career. In terms of job opportunities, there is a demand for more verification engineers compared to design engineers. You can check job portal to verify that. Front end engineer with strong interest in architecture and microarchitecture can also grow as system design architects and microarchitects. Based on our personal experience in industry, we have seen many people with outstanding programming skill and love for exploring complexity of any programming language have made excellent front-end engineer. They are good at verbal and non-verbal reasoning skill, finding an odd man out. If you have natural instinct of finding category or case or subcase or sublogic breakdowns and really really enjoy programming although less bothered about the semiconductor process technology front end is the perfect domain for you now let's move to back end design flow back end is the method where we translate the design from synthesizable rtn design to physical silicon vapor so now on in back end flow we all talk a lot about constraint limitation viability etc the major steps in back end design flow are floor planning Floor planning determines the size, shape and locations of modules in a chip and as such, it estimates the total chip area, the interconnects and delay. Next come place and route. As the name suggests, the place and route process places each macro from the synthesized netlist into an available location on the silicon and connects the macros using routing resources available. Next come DRC and LVS. DRC is design rule check. These are a series of parameters provided by semiconductor manufacturers that enable the designer to verify the correctness of a mask set. Design rules are specific to a particular semiconductor manufacturing process. The layout versus schematic or LVS is the class of electronic design automation verification software that determines whether a particular integrated circuit layout corresponds to the original schematic or circuit diagram of the design. Next come physical verification. Physical verification is a process whereby an IC layout design is verified via EDS software tools to ensure correct electrical and logical functionality and manufacturability. Next come parasitic extraction. Parasitic extraction is the calculation of parasitic effects on both the design devices and the required wiring interconnects of an electronic circuit. The major purpose of parasitic extraction is to create an accurate analog model of the circuit so that detailed simulations can emulate actual digital and analog circuit responses. Next come post layout STA. STA is the process of timing verification that verifies a design for setup time and violation and hold time violation. Next come electro migration and ion drop analysis. Electro migration is the movement of atoms based on the flow of current through a material. If the current density is high enough, the heat dissipated within the material will repeatedly break atoms from the structure and move them. Iron drop is the voltage drop in the metal wires constituting the power grid before it reaches the power pins of the standard cells. It becomes very important to limit the iron drop as it affects the speed of the cells and overall performance of the chip. Next come engineering change order. Whenever any issue found at the layout level netlist after multiple stages as discussed above are done and there is very less room to do a large modification as per the corrective suggestion from the tape out team, we go for surgical changes inside the layout and this is well known as ECU. Next come layout equivalence check and tape out. Formal equivalence checking process is a part of electronic design automation commonly used during the development of digital integrated circuits to formally prove that two representations of a circuit design exhibit exactly the same behavior. And finally, the tape out is specifically the point at which 
the graphic for the photo mask of the circuit is sent to the fabrication facility. So, on the back end side, engineers can start with logic synthesis, placement and routing, layout, physical verification, static timing analysis. Most of the back end engineers would need a better understanding of process technologies, transistor, CMOS, high speed design issues, power consumption, leakage current, and a good grasp of tool and automation, basic of semiconductor device physics. If you have deep interest, in semiconductor process technology love to see everything on silicon more keen on semiconductor physics at the layout level and you have a nature to explore unknown territory then backend is perfect for you in terms of opportunities and importance both front-end and back-end engineers are equally important for a company and their job roles are equally challenging. Both will have equal opportunities in terms of building a career and opportunities to earn. So, choose based on your interest, basic nature and inclination. Then everyday work will excite you and work pressure before every release will not drain you. So, keep learning and keep enjoying the journey. Hey guys, welcome to Tech Simplified TV. In today's episode, we are going to discuss about various VLSI domains where you can apply for a job. We'll also discuss about different skill sets needed for each of these domains. So, watch till the end to get all the details and tips. Hey guys, we are at our slide. In today's episode, the viewer's question is, Sir, make a video about domains like what we do in design or verification and what we do in physical design because nowhere in youtube find these videos saying about the domains please say about all the domains so people can find their interest lot of people what the work that they do in a particular domain hope you do the video i would like to thank Gandhi Sai Prasad, thank you very much for making up this request and uh, this is a very 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 broad question. It may be written in four lines but the answer will be uh, very long so instead of a single episode there will be multiple episodes. Watch all the episodes to cover all the various domains in VLSI. I have already made a video on the VLSI ecosystem, what all types of the companies they exist in VLSI. I am giving the link in the description. You can watch that video. Now in this video, we will discuss about various VLSI domain. So let us see the skeleton. We will go through the slides which will contain several infographics to provide you the answer that has been asked by Sai Prasad. So first we will cover VLSI domain from a bird's eye view. Next we explore domains inside digital design. Next we explore domains inside analog design. Next we explore domains inside analog mix signal design. Next we explore domains inside IP design and characterization. Next we will explore domains inside test chip unit. And finally we will discuss the common fabric of all the domains that is CAD automation that is omnipresent in all of the domains. So in this is a very long series containing very very high quantity of information. So in today's episode we will discuss about this and this. So without any further delay let's begin. VLSI domains parts eye view. In this slide you will be introduced to various domains inside the entire VLSI ecosystem. This oval represents the superset of the VLSI domains. Now, let me introduce the subsets one by one. Although I am calling them subsets with respect to the bigger set, but they itself are the domains that were asked in the question. So, here is our digital design. The digital design exists for multiple types of chip making technologies such as ASIC, application specific IC, FPGA, field programmable gate array and SOC that is system on chip. I will walk you through the digital design flow in upcoming episodes in the Q&A track. Next is the analog design flow. In college, you have came across PLL, op-amp, oscillators and many more analog circuit operations. This also come as IC. These ICs are designed in the analog design domain. 
there is a third domain which is a mixture of both the analog and digital domains this is called the analog mix signal domain also known as ams domain this is becoming very popular with recent advancement in technology you might have heard about esb sardis mipi these are all good examples of ams design domain now each of the analog or digital design needs building blocks or units with unique functionality these will be used when we design a very large circuit another side is that also whatever designs we make through various dlsi eda softwares must be realized in actual silicon to observe the on chip performance for this two important needs there exist two more very very important domains in all of the above mentioned domains the first one is ip design here we make unit cells or design block standard cell is such a famous set of ip collection which every digital design needs a set of standard cell will contain combinational logic gate sequential elements level shifters and many other important cells needed for the physical design analog ip examples are dc dc pll a to d and d to a converters any kind of unit memory cell etc the next is test chip the test chip as the name suggests is a full functional chip for the design under test this design can be a digital block analog block or ams block in other words the test chip is a miniature prototype of the actual ic in vlsi this is a actual silicon chip manufactured in fab that is foundry this chip is tested in breadboard level and the outcome is compared to the eda simulation values then the company Comparison details are published as silicon report. So here we are done the bird's eye view. So let's move on. Domains inside digital design. The digital design can be for ASIC, FPGA, or an SOC. In digital design, the design flow often referred to as the RTL to GDS2. As the design start with the RTL coding and ends up in a GDS2 string. So here goes our entire digital domain. The first is RTL. For RTL coding domain, you need skills like Verilog, VHDL and System Verilog. Your knowledge must be at the expert level and not as far the beginner level. That means you have to know each and every bric a brac of the HDLs I have just mentioned and making designs, making complex circuitries with all these languages. The next one is verification. Here you do the functionality verification using system Verilog assertions, UVM, OVM verification methodologies. So you need an expert level knowledge on assertions, UVM, OVM, etc. To get the expert level knowledge, you must consider the LRM, that is language reference manual. It's okay if you're learning from a book, but this language reference manual obviously helps you to get the accurate information information one more thing these languages are continuously updated as per the vlsi industry need and progress so you must consult the latest lrn and not an old one next comes the domain called the dft that is designed for testability here you deal with ic design techniques implemented inside the chip to conduct manufacturing tests for this you must have skills on software such as tetramax dft compiler etc you will come across terminologies such as atpg ate bist mbist jtag etc as skill sets for this dft domain till up to this point we were at the front end now we are entering into the back end or physical design and the domains are pnr cts eco layout i have captured them inside one single circle at the very beginning of physical design a engineer deals with eda tools for pnr that is place and route clock tree synthesis that is cts layout and its eco that is engineering change order the physical design engineer translates the tested and verified netlist into layouts hence he or she makes a physical layout which will be fabricated on silicon so this is termed as physical design tools like encounter or icc2 you need to learn for this particular stage 
नेक्स्ट डोमेन इज फिजिकल वेरिफिकेशन दिस इंक्लूड फिजिकल ले आउट वेरिफिकेशन यूजिंग मेथड सच एज डिजाइन रूल चेक ले आउट वर्सेज की इलेक्ट्रिकल रूल चेक दैट इज ई आर सी यू नीड टू लर्न एंड गेव एफर्ट इज इन टूल्स लाइक आई सी वैलिडेटर आई सी वी आर दैट इज पी ई आर सी आई वी पी एस एटसेट्रा वंस ऑल द वेरिफिकेशन आर ओके दैट इज नो एर इज फाउंड यू कैन एट्रैक्ट द पैरासाइटिक्स एज पी एफ और एस बी पी एफ विद the help of extraction engine such as tarrc then you can run electro migration and ir drop check that is emir verification you may need to gain expertise in tool such as red hawk totem volta spy thus you confirm reliability checks and complete the physical verification of the layout The next domain is STA, that is static timing analysis. This can be done in pre-layout also, but mostly it is considered as a part of the physical design. To gain expertise in STA, you must develop skills on the STA tools such as prime time, encounter timing system, and tempest. The next domain is sign off. This is most crucial and important before the GDS2 is sent out for tape out which goes to foundry. Often the engineer working in this domain is referred to as a tape out engineer. Generally this is a very very senior position with hands on experience on multiple tape out. This stage a engineer must have a sound knowledge of the entire RTL to GDS2 flow the sign off tools such as NEC SEA IRM etc are needed as your skill set again emphasizing that due to the criticality of this position you can reach only when you have enough experience this is certainly not for freshers now in large product companies you may see that separate teams are working on separate domains as you can see in this slide but in case of a startup one person that is one engineer may hold the responsibility for more than one domain so i have made clear all the domains in the digital design and hence we have reached the end of this particular slide so let's move on hey guys welcome to tech simplified tv in today's episode we will be discussing about analog and analog mix signal domains although by name these two sounds very similar but in terms of skill set they are much different watch till the end to know the difference and details of these two domains here we are and the slide in this series we are answering to gali sai prasad's question as mentioned earlier that the answer will come in multiple episodes here we are in the second episode let's move on to the next slide this is the same menu as of the last episode we have covered this and this in the last episode so in today's episode we will cover this and this so without any further delay let's begin domains inside analog design Here the oven represents the entire analog design domain. Now, where you are in college, you might have been encountered Spice language through P Spice student edition. That knowledge will be very relevant in this analog design domain. In analog electronics, you have come across analog circuits such as op amp, PLL, oscillators, etc. These type of integrated circuits, that is the ICs, are designed in this particular domain. we start with the schematic design now let me give some background why schematic capture is important in college when you have learned the spice language to convert a circuit diagram into the spice language you have to mark each node by hand with a particular number then you have to use a text editor to write the dot cir file this is good enough for the college level small circuits their design and analysis but when we do the large design in the various industry this is not a very fruitful method so we need some method which is far more efficient in the industry level analog circuit design in schematic capture you have a gui where you can drag and drop various active and passive circuit elements visually and make the entire connection in point and drag method thus you can do a design block also known as a design unit you can save this particular unit in the pre existing pdk library for reuse at any later time also you can 
Cannon use small pre-designed blocks coming with your PDK design library. Once you make a schematic design, you can include all the spikes analysis methods and run the simulation directly. Also, you have a choice to export the schematic into spice.cif file and then simulate with your PICE tool. To work in the schematic capture, your base of analog electronics must be very strong. Also, you have to learn few more softwares like Cadence Virtuoso and Synopsys Custom Compiler. Both these tools have schematic capture in them. However, you can start using the free software called LT Spice, which has the schematic capture capability. Here, in the pre-layout, functionality verification is nothing but analysis with methods like transient, AC, DC, or noise analysis. In this stage, you may need to create several test vectors for various combinations of the input pins of your analog design. In analog electronics, generally, the test vectors are written using piecewise linear, that is PWL, or pulsed vectors. You have to use several measure statements, that is PICE commands, to get the required data from the output waveform. Thus, you will tally your input vectors versus the output response of the design under test. Once we are done with the functionality verification, we move on to the layout design. Generally, the unit blocks are done by hand. Then, they are put into the PDK library. For a bigger design, the routing engine is used. As compared to the digital counterpart, generally the analog layouts are not such huge size. So, semi-custom or full custom layout techniques are used for case-by-case -case basis. Both the virtuoso and the custom compiler have the layout capability. So, in a nutshell, you have to learn either of these two tools if you want to work in this particular domain. The physical verification is same as the digital flow. This is because once the layout is ready, we cannot really differentiate it with the layout coming from the digital. In layout, everything is in terms of diffusion region, wells, poly, several metal layers, via interconnect, etc. So, the physical verification is done using tools like Caliber DRC, PVS, ICV, etc. The layout is made clean of the DRC and LVS errors. Then, the DSP is extracted using SARRC tool. Using this DSPF, EM and IR violations are detected and corresponding rectification is done going back into the layout. We also check the antenna rule check and ERC at this age. Generally, these are done using the Caliber, PVS and ICV tools. The EMIR are done using custom sim EMIR, Voltas file, etc. You have to learn these tools to work into the physical verification domain. Thus, we conclude the physical verification check. The post layout functionality check is done to see the impact of the parasitic resistance capacitance and coupling capacitance coming from the extracted DSPF netlist. The DSPF is simulable by the industry standard PI skills. They use a method called RTTC back annotation to stitch the parasitics from the DSPF back into the pre layout schematic netlist. Thus, with the same test vectors from the pre layout stage, the shift in the behavior of the design under test is observed. As per the percentage of the shift separate actions are taken case by case basis to ensure that the original intended performance of the design under test is within the permissible change limit. At this stage, industry standard spice and pass spice or accelerated spice tools are used, such as a spice, yellow, vector, custom scene, a scene, fine scene, ultra scene, etc. These industry standard spice tools use the multi threading or multi core software technology to deal with with the huge design database. We are done with this particular slide, so let's move on. Domains inside AMS design. In recent times, the AMS designs are becoming hugely popular. The scaling down of the technology node below 10 nanometer pushed the semiconductor industry to think with a different approach. Hence, the analog mixed signal designs are getting pulled from the various parts of the semiconductor ecosystem. In analog mixed signal design, both digital block as well as analog block are present. 
This oval represents the system level design. In AMS, we start with a little bit different approach. We go either top down or bottom up approach. In either approach, we design the blocks with system level modeling with TC++, Simulink or System Verilog. All of these skill sets are needed to work at this particular level. Next comes the schematic design for the analog block. I have already mentioned in detail in the last slide of this particular episode. Here we use tools like Virtuoso or Custom Compiler. The next comes the behavioral design. Now, this is the most important part of the AMS design for you right now. You are well aware that Verilog is used for digital RTL model. Similarly, Verilog A is used for the analog behavioral modeling. When we want to use both of them, we have their parent level superset called Verilog AMS. Verilog AMS makes room for both Verilog and Verilog A to work together. It has same additional features to deal with the modern day AMS behavioral modeling. So at this stage, you must have skills like Verilog, System Verilog, Verilog AMS, Verilog A and VHDL AMS, etc. Next, we have the very critical stage that is the mixed signal verification. Here, we have special kind of simulator pair that is analog simulator plus digital simulator working together and handshaking for cross-domain signal transaction. In such kind of verification, the analog simulator such as PICE or Verilog A simulates the analog circuit block. At the same time, the digital simulator such as Verilog or SB simulator simulates the digital block from the entire design. Both the simulations happen concurrently and with the exact same time step and time scale. Wherever needed, handshake happens between the two. One thing to emphasize that at the analog digital boundary, proper A to D or D to A converters have to be properly configured. Thus, transaction between analog signal and digital signal happen without any errors. For this stage, you must have skills on industry standard AMS tools such as Virtuoso MS, West ID MS, Custom Sim VCS from the three major EDA tool vendors. Once the netlists are OK, then we go to the PNR and layout. At this stage, the layout is done for the digital and analog parts. You have to learn the AMS layout skills for Virtuoso AMS, West ID MS and Custom Compiler AMS layout. Once the layout is done, the physical verification is taken care. There we use the DRC or LVS tools such as Caliber DRC, EVS, ICV, etc. We also check for the ERC that is electrical rule check. One more important thing to mention here, sometimes you have to do the coding of DRC rules by yourself. For this, each tool have their own language. In open world, you may learn Tickle that is tool command language because some of the tools uses Tickle to code their DRC rules. You must have silicon fabrication process knowledge as a must have fundamental for this stage that is physical verification. EMIR checks are done on the layout and violations are mitigated by layout correction. I have already mentioned the EMIR tool names in previous digital and analog domains already. Finally, the chip goes for the tape out. We are done with this particular slide so let's move on. Hey guys, welcome to Tech Simplified TV. You know that necessity is the mother of invention. You are wondering why I am saying this to you now. Well, I am coming to that in a moment. In today's episode, we will talk about the IP design and characterization domain in detail. We will talk about all the various types of IPs out there in the VLSI. Now, to know why I have mentioned that the necessity is the mother of invention, you have to watch till the end of this episode. We are in the slide. We are answering to viewers question. Gali Sai Prasad who has asked sir make a video about domains like what we do in design or verification and what we do in physical design pause nowhere in YouTube find the videos saying about domains please say about domains so people can find their interest lot of people want the work to do in particular domain hope you do the video so we are making the video and uh, we have already published two episodes today is the third one as you know, the answer is coming through multiple episodes. So let's begin. So this is our series skeleton. We have so far covered this, 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 
this in last two episodes in today's episode we will cover this so without any further delay let's begin IP design and characterization. Before beginning anything, I would like to talk about IP. The full form of IP is intellectual property. This is the dictionary meaning. In VLSI, IP means a self-sufficient design block which has finite number of inputs and outputs. There should be always a particular functionality associated with this design block. The purpose of the IP is to create once and use many times as as required. I would like to explain the terminology characterization in VLSI. This is a process to do the electrical current voltage power variation and record the intended level of changes. This is done through VLSI EDA softwares meant for characterization purpose for various types of IPs. This oval represents the entire IP domain. Now, let us see what different types of IPs are designed in the VLSI domain. One thing I would like to mention before going any further that is all the IP types that I am going to describe are designed by different teams inside a single company that is IP vendor or IP vendor company may design few of the IP types based on people's expertise with them. When when you apply for a job in IP vendor company, you may get allocated to one of the specific IP design team. You cannot be omnipresent in all of the IP design team. So you have to make a judicious choice when you enter into the IP design company, also known as IP vendor. Also, many IP companies put the exact IP domain in the job description that will help you to understand the particular type of IP they are designing. The standard cell IPs are the most widely used IPs. Why? Because these are the heart of any digital design like ASIC or SOC design. Also, most of the time, the characterization jobs are for standard cell characterization. Generally, the standard cell IP library contains huge number of total cells. Here, I would like to mention that each design block are called cell in any part of the IP design. Now, the standard cells have collection of unit logic cells, sequential cells, combinational cells, power management cells, special type of cells like pillar cells, decap cells, A2D, D2A cells and ECO cells etc. There exists PVT variation that is process temperature voltage variation, pressure voltage variation, metal track variation in the standard cell library. One more thing based on the process there could be FinFET or CMOS variation. Another type of variation comes from the bulk or SY substrate that on which the IP is getting designed. Thus, containing all the variation, this is the largest big fat IP category in the entire IP domain. Next, we talk about the memory IPs. Memory is an essential part of any electronic gadgets in recent time. Memory is found in CPU cache, PC RAM, smartphone, internal and external memory, smartphone appliances, pen drive, SSD hard drive, smartwatch, etc. Thus, we have memory everywhere. Various needs as mentioned just now require memory IPs broadly categorized as SRAM, DRAM, ENVM that is non-volatile memory flash and BRAM that is battery powered RAM. Generally, memory design has two parts, unit memory cell design and memory array design. Sometimes like in case of SRAM, we have another part called memory compiler design. These are the design part and the characterization part is also there. Sometimes it is called the memory verification too. Next, we have analog IP. These are pure analog design blocks with single function. A few examples of analog IPs are DCDC IP, PLL IP, Audio IP, DLL IP, etc. The PLL IP is used as clock source. The DCDC IP is used in power bank. Audio IPs are used in the audio unit of any electronic gadget. Many other analog IPs you may find during your search. 
The next type of IP is SERDIS, which stands for Serializer and Deserializer. These IPs convert parallel data into serial data and vice versa. These are like hotcakes nowadays due to the popularity of its usage in handheld devices. Nowadays, a lot of companies investing a huge manpower in this IP sector. So, this is a prime standalone IP which speaks for itself. The next set of very very popular IPs are USB, MIPI and PHY. These are mixed signal IPs like SERDIS. USB IPs are like hotcake because we are having so many plug and play devices around us which use the USB port for data exchange. And you also know that there are so many USB port variation exist nowadays due to the variety of USB dependent devices like printer, scanner, smartphone, OTG devices, OTG pen drive USB headphone, microphone, USB webcam, personal MP3 player, iPods and so many such devices. MIPI and PHY are very much popular like the USB also. The next kind of IP is the I.O. pad IP. You know that any silicon chip needs the I.O. interface to talk and listen with the external circuitry. This I.O. part of any silicon chip is contributed by the I.O. pad IPs. Thus, this is a IP that every silicon chip needs. We are done with this particular side. So, let's move on. IP design views and characterization. IPs are basically small design blocks. So if it is a digital IP or an analog IP or an AMS IP, we follow the respective design methods as described in previous episodes. One thing I would like to emphasize that IP level, the unit cell layout is always handmade, that is handcrafted. This is because these are the building blocks. Here lies the difference from the previously mentioned all design flows. Now let us see what but all the views are corresponding skill sets you need to have. When you are designing any digital IP, the unit cell must have a Verilog, System Verilog or VHEL representation of the unit cell. For analog IP, the HDL changes to Verilog A or sometimes Verilog AMS based on the end application. So, working at this stage requires the mentioned HDL knowledge. The timing library characterization is the one of the most popular, also you can call famous, job title. For standard cells, we call this as standard cell characterization. At this stage, dynamic timing analysis is performed using Liberate or Silicon Smart EDA softwares for the standard cells library. The dynamic timing analysis at the unit cell level is a set of size simulation from which the rise time, fall time, delay, slew, load, all these data are collected and and put in Liberty format, that is .lib. For IPs other than standard cell, the choice of the characterization tool may be a pure spice, a fast spice, or an accelerated spice. Few names are a spice, vector, eldo, hsim, fine sim, ultra sim, custom sim. Among these, you may learn the pure spice by yourself, but fast spice or accelerated spice are available only inside the VLSI industry. The layout at any IP unit cell is handcrafted. Here, at the unit cell level, you design everything in form of diffusion layer, poly, substrate, metal 1, via 1, metal 2, etc. The five formats that you deal with are .oa and GDS2. For this, you use either of the tools such as Virtuoso or Custom Compiler from the major EDA tool vendors. So, you must develop your skills on these tools. One free tool you may use to practice the basics is magic layout. The schematic is an essential part of the analog IP design. Here, you have a library of active and passive components from which you can drag and drop components in your workspace. Then, you interconnect them with where at power source and ground. Then, you add analysis type like AC, DC or transients as per the application of the IP. Thus, you can create and test unit cells of analog IP. You need to have a set of virtuoso or custom compiler schematic capture tool. You can also have the taste of schematic based free tool LT for your practice. 
the parasitic extraction view that is PEX view consists of the RCCC that is resistance, capacitance and coupling capacitance extracted netlist from the layout. For this stage, your layout must be DRC and LVSC. You must know TARRC or QRC extraction tools as per the QSET. There is another layout format view called left depth. This view is for cadence PNR tools only. Skill set is same as mentioned in the layout section pictorially just above of this lock. Spice or CDL is another view of the analog eyepiece. The skill sets are same as the schematic capture as you can see pictorially above and discussed few minutes back. Physical verification view are there in the eyepiece. These could be for EMIR or DRC or ERC or LVS. At this stage, you must have tool knowledge such as ICV, PVS, Caliber, Volta Psi, Custom Sim EMIR, etc. In summary, I can say that eyepiece are developed as per the need of the technological progress. We have discussed many types of IP in this episode, but I can bet that you will find many innovative in the IP domain in upcoming years. We are done with this slide, so let's move on. Hello and welcome to Tech Simplified TV. In today's episode, we will talk about two hidden domains in VLSI. These are hidden because these two domains do not get much limelight as compared to the other domains. These domains require multiple skills and inter-team domain knowledge and some management skills. So, these are not very pointed domain like STA, PD or verification which get a lot of hype as these are important step in IC design process and these require very very pointed skill set. Today we will be talking about test chip and CAD automation domains. These are two inevitable parts of the VLSI industry. To know why they are inevitable, stay tuned till the end of this episode. We are in the slide now. In this series, we are answering two viewers question. Gali Sai Prasad who has asked sir make a video about domains like what we do in design verification and what we do in physical design cause nowhere in the YouTube find the videos saying about the domains. Please say about the domains so people can get find their interest. Lot of people want the work to do in the particular domain. Hope you do the video. As you know we are answering to this question through multiple episodes. Today is the final episode. So let's begin. In this series, we have answered the question by following series skeleton as displayed in the screen. So far, we have covered this, 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 this and this. Today, we will talk about this and this. So, without any further delay, let's begin. Domains inside test chip unit. In any of the domains discussed so far, we make a design to achieve a target functionality. This could be a digital design or a analog design or a mid signal design. Each design have to fulfill its design specification in the software as well as in the silicon. For this purpose, the test chip also known as a prototype chip. Even for a IP design units, we can have test chips constituted out of the designed IPs. Thus, the figure of merit of the IPs can be verified on the silicon and compared against the simulation values. This oval represents the entire domain of test chips. Now, let us visit the different pockets where the test chip units exist in VLSI. In the RTN to GDS to flow, we make SOC and this flow is generally called the ASIC design flow. Here, we make multi-million gate chips. The toolkits that are used in the design process are standardized through the toolkit regression checks. Here, in this regression for each technology node, we have small test chip designs included already. These test chips are designed once and reused again and again. Now, these designs are upgraded technologically with advancement of either the technology node progression or the novel fabrication process improvement. The design process of the test chips are same as the SOC design flow discussed in earlier episodes. 
Schematic to GDS to flow is for the analog designs. Here, the designs are itself smaller than the ASIC chips. Hence, the test chips are comparatively smaller. The test chip designs are also reused over technology known progression. The distinctiveness of the analog designs are that there will be many innovations to improve functionality, leakage, power, and timing. The innovations are a kind of unique in analog design domain. All of these innovations are tested in the software and finally in the silicon to test steps. The skill set needed here is same as the analog design flow discussed in earlier episodes. Full chip verification is applicable to all of the test chip domains captured in this slide. Here, we use robust simulators, both analog and digital, as applicable. The verification for analog, digital, and analog mix signal are already discussed in previous respective episodes. The difference in that full chip verification is much more rigorous and time consuming. Hence, you have to be at the advanced level. This means you have to be seasoned with each verification verification of respective domain and you must know advanced features and methods of verification EDA softwares. DFT is very important subdomain. Here, all the DFT related tool knowledge are essential and mandatory. Here, at the test chip level, you have to be thorough in DFT troubleshoot. In DFT, to troubleshoot any kind of issues from software to silicon. Post silicon validation is to deal with the silicon chip. We have the physical chip here and have to use all the physical measuring system in the breadboard level. Your knowledge of instrumentation and handling advanced equipments is necessary. Practical knowledge is preferred over theoretical knowledge. This is similar to the practical sessions that you do with your equipments such as CRO etc. Here, more advanced laboratory equipments such as from Agilent Technologies and many other vendors are needed. Here, in this domain, the practical sessions from your college days are leveraged. Preparing the silicon report is the final domain. Here, you list out software versus silicon results across various dyes and PVTs. Generally, the figure of merit are captured in silicon report. This is the highest experience level. You cannot join as a fresher at this age. This requires a lot of on-job experience over multiple years. The reason why so is the silicon report goes to the customer and it has a direct impact on the business relationship of a existing customer or winning a completely new customer. We are done with this particular slide so let's move on. VLSI CAD domain. This overall represents the entire CAD domain. Often CAD is also known as EDA automation domain as per the application. This CAD automation is omnipresent across all the domains discussed so far. For this domain, splitting knowledge of Perl, Bash, Trickle, Python, and Ruby are needed. Also, you have to have knowledge of the end tools, that is, EDA softwares for the respective domain. You have to have strong written and spoken spoken communication skills because you have to frequently chat with different designers of a same team or across multiple teams. If the domain has interdependency then you have to have cross-domain knowledge. Professional introvertness is much needed in such CAD role. Now let us focus one by one into all of the subdomains. The front-end CAD requires to create or maintain the design flow from RTL or schematic up to just before the layout in both analog or digital design. The required tool knowledge is already discussed in all of the previous episodes. Sometimes your knowledge of each design stage could face a challenge during solution of a bug. So you have to be very upkeep in learning all the hot and happening things that your CAD automation covers. The DFT CAD requires the automation to provide smooth DFT inspections over a given design. As said earlier, your knowledge must be up to date for domain tool or hot and happening things. 
The PNR CAD involves the proper layouting mechanism automation. In digital or analog, both you must know tickle as per the automation of the layouting steps. For Cadence PNR, you may need to learn skill language, which is Cadence's proprietary language and not like the open language as SQL. For PNR, your domain knowledge of semiconductor fabrication technology must be crystal clear. You must brush up stick diagram concept before entering this domain. The physical verification CAD plays a very very important role in either analog or digital design. You must have theoretical knowledge of EMIR, DRC, LVS, antenna rule check for this particular domain. As per the end tools, you must know ICV, PVS, Caliber from the major EDA vendors. As a CAD person, you may have to code the DRC, ERC or EMIR rules as per the language of the respective tools. Just mention now. For this, you have to understand the design rule document coming from the foundry and to be found inside the PDK. Your regular scripting knowledge of Perl, Bash, Tickle, etc. are also needed for wearing things up. IP view CAD is applicable for the IP vendor companies and may be applicable for a design house who extend views with respect to various multiple EDA softwares that they use. In the IP view CAD, you need to maintain consistency across various views of a single unit IP through CAD automation checks. The various views may be from various design stages. Again, each stage have Special variation for multiple vendor tools. For one single vendor, the views may vary from 2 to 3 EDA tool release versions. So, such overall complex distribution can only be maintained through automation. This automation may report missing view of a particular IP of any kind. The IP quality check of an quality assurance is maintained through IP QA QC CAD. Here, the purpose of the automation is to check the view compatibility with respect to the specific EDA software. This automation ensures the complex IP view distribution to be QC passed for each of their respective tool. Also, for IP vendor, the automation must ensure the quality standard specified by the foundry technology node. For for this, you have to have top to bottom domain knowledge of the specific IP type that is either analog or digital or analog mix signal. Design environment CAD is to provide easy environment for the designer so that he or she don't have to bother about the changes in the EDA software. Such design environment CAD provides the designer a plug and play interface for the designer. The CAD cockpit provides designer an easy interface which may have complex steps in the background developed and maintained by the CAD engineer. CLI to GUI CAD requires GUI automation knowledge such as Tickle TK, CAD and Seal, QT GUI, Python GUI. Here, the GUI means GUI. Here, the CAD engineer designs a GUI for the designer who operates the GUI. The GUI is designed and maintained in such a way that it may translate the GUI instructions into command line instruction in the background. Then, run the tool and finally display the results back to the GUI. UI. So thus, it saves a lot of effort for the designer. This impacts the turnaround time of the design from start to finish. Here, you need the domain knowledge also. Before concluding, I would like to mention a few more skill set that you need to have anywhere in the CAD domain. These are concurrent version system, CVS or its latest avatar, SVN. These are version control systems for the automation strip repositories. You also have to have knowledge of the Univa Green Engine abbreviated as UGE or IBM Load Sharing Facility abbreviated as LSF to judiciously use the computational resources that is end machines. Sometimes you may have to recreate a fault or error by your own before solving the problem. Root cause analysis is a much needed troubleshooting skill for the CAD domain. Sometimes a front-end CAD engineer may have to talk to a back-end CAD engineer or IP CAD engineer and vice versa all along. You must be well equipped to open support tickets against tool issues in the respective EDS software support portal. That's all for for today, we are done with this particular slide, so let's move on.
Hello and welcome to Tech Simplified TV. In today's episode, we will discuss about different job roles and their scope of work in VLSI. If you are a fresher or planning to join the domain, this video will help you. So, stay tuned till the end of the video. Let's get into the topic. First, Design Engineer. Design Engineer is a job role where the engineer designs a brand new circuit for an upcoming chip or modifies an existing design already realized in form of a published chip. In VLSI, we design fresh chips as per need. Hence, we have to start a design from scratch. Here, the need of a design engineer come into the picture. Design engineer can work at associate chip level, sub-chip or subsystem level or IP level. Now, let's discuss about the different design engineer roles we usually see across entire VLSI arena. First, RTL Design Engineer. They design a particular digital circuit using HDL. They take help of state machine to capture and incorporate any novel digital design. The job role may include the responsibilities like designing the functions of modules of the system on chip as per input and output specification, optimizing the design to achieve best power performance and area, implementation and verification of high performance and low power clock distribution network and building block. Second in the list is Physical Design Engineer. Physical Design Engineer has to work on the chip layout. The work may start from floor planning and may go up to engineering change order. Third, IP Level Design Engineer. Design at the very block level with basic functionalities. The nature of design could be digital, analog or digital plus analog that is mixed signal. Number four is the Digital Design Engineer or Architect. Such engineers are responsible for defining and realizing Digital functions on IP, subsystem or IC level based on required specification. Number 5. Analog Design Engineer. If the IP and the design is uh, analog one, then we call them analog design engineer. Different types of memory design comes under analog design. Second type of position is verification engineer. Well, after design engineer post, let's understand about verification engineer. When a design is made by a design engineer, it has to get verified for its intended functionality with all sorts of possible permutation and combination of input and control signal values. Hence, the need of a verification engineer comes into the picture. Depending on nature of the circuit and methodology of verification, we can further divide job roles into digital verification, analog verification, AMS verification and DFT. Verification engineers design and implement testing procedures to determine if products work as intended. These skilled engineers are responsible for creating the initial product verification methodology Selecting the testing environments and developing testing plans. First, Digital Verification The Digital Verification Engineer operates before the FPGA ASIC or SOC production phase. He works with the design teams that is FPG engineers or microelectronic engineers etc. in order to verify their designs that is IP subsystem or system. The verification can be realized at different abstraction level. Until unit blocks verification. The verification can be made at the RTL blocks level. Thus, we test all the functionalities of an IP through simulations. Verification at the subsystem level. The verification can also be realized at the subsystem level, including several IP. Then, we check all their functionalities and their integration in the subsystem. Third is top level verification. Once the RTL design is verified at the unit level, we can integrate it at the top level. Required skill for this kind of position includes skill in ASIC or FPGA verification, basic knowledge in design techniques Verilog or VHDN, a good knowledge of simulation flow, good understanding in scripting, Python, Perl, Bash, etc. Second type of verification is analog verification. Analog verification is a methodology for performing functional verification on analog mixed signal and RF integrated circuits and system on chip. Third is analog mixed signal verification, a single verification environment combining both analog and digital solvers that can be used to functionally verify at the desired level of accuracy using their option or both digital and analog engines. Metric driven verification to analog components in a mixed signal design. Number four is DFT. Above mentioned three verifications are pre-production whereas DFT is done after production of the chip. During the design process, extra logic is put in the design which actually used to do post-production testing. The purpose of DFT is to validate or verify that the end product does not contain any manufacturing defects. After verification engineers, next in the list is 
डी और फिजिकल डिजाइन इंजीनियर मूविंग टू फिजिकल डिजाइन मीन्स मूविंग फ्रॉम एब्सट्रक्ट लेवल टू सिलीकन लेवल सो एक्चुअली ऑल द इंजीनियर्स लुक टू द डिजाइन थ्रू लेंस ऑफ सिलीकन फिजिकल डिजाइन और बैक एंड स्टार्ट आफ्टर सिंथिस एंड इनक्लूड स्टेप अप टू साइन ऑफ सो बेसिकली फ्लोर प्लानिंग प्लेसमेंट एंड राउटिंग टाइमिंग और एस टी ए पावर बजेटिंग एंड एरिया इम्प्लीमेंटेशन ईसीओ टास्क दट इज टाइमिंग एंड फंक्शनल ईसीओ टू एड्रेस फंक्शनल बग्स एंड टाइमिंग वायलेशन फिजिकल वेरिफिकेशन लाइक एलवीएस डी एस सी एक्सेट्रा नॉइज एनालिसिस इलेक्ट्रो माइग्रेशन एंटेना चेक्स ऑल दिस कम्स अंडर जॉब रोल ऑफ अ पी डी इंजीनियर ऑब्वियस इट शुड बी अ बिग टीम टू परफॉर्म एंड कम्प्लीट ऑल दिस कम्प्लेक्स वर्क रिक्वायर्ड टेक्निकल एंड प्रोफेशनल एक्सपर्टाइज फॉर अ पी डी इंजीनियर इंक्लूड गुड नॉलेज एंड हैंड्स ऑन एक्सपीरियंस इन फिजिकल डिजाइन मेथडोलॉजी विच इंक्लूड लॉजिक सिंथेसिस प्लेसमेंट क्लॉक थ्री सिंथेसिस राउटिंग इट्स एक्सपेक्टेड दट द कैंडिडेट शुड बी नॉलेजेबल इन फिजिकल वेरिफिकेशन दैट इज एल वी एस डी एस सी एक्सेट्रा नॉइज एनालिसिस पावर एनालिसिस एंड इलेक्ट्रो माइग्रेशन गुड नॉलेज एंड हैंड्स ऑन एक्सपीरियंस इन स्टैटिक टाइमिंग एनालिसिस गुड अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ टाइमिंग कॉन्स्ट्रेंट्स ऑटोमेशन स्किल्स इन पॉल स्किल और टिकल आर एक्सपेक्टेड strong background of asic physical design that is flow planning pnr extraction i and drop analysis timing and signal integrity closure etc extensive experience and detailed knowledge in cadence and synopsis or manual tools are much preferred expertise in scripting languages such as power tickle strong physical verification skill set etc required after physical design engineer next is application engineer application engineer works at the customer interface they both take care internal and external customers it doesn't mean to meet the customer face to face always there is a continuous communication via mail or ticketing system they take care of customer needs let's understand this from perspective of a eda tool vendor an eda tool company sell its products or tools to many design houses every company wants to make their tool bug free although all tool have some bug when the engineers from design team of some other company face any issue regarding the tool they get back to the eda tool vendor and application engineer from eda company look into the issues then the application engineer take r&d team in the loop and give solution to the customer this is basically post sale position in some cases application engineer post is pre sale position and their job role include visit to customer campus in such visit actually they meet new teams try to understand if there is any requirement where their eda tool can fit if a fae can take up any lead and convert it into sale then the matter goes to account manager and sales executives this job role requires communication skills including written verbal through web and zoom or google meet field application engineer corporate application engineer application consultant are some popular designation of application engineers the job title depends on companies this kind of job role gives you satisfaction of solving problem high stress of handling demanding customers glamour of traveling and obviously you will get amazing experience of people interface Fifth job role is CAD engineer. CAD engineers are expert in CAD tool and they develop flows that integrate multiple tools creating a rather seamless environment for other engineers to use. Develops and applies computer aided design software engineering methods theories and research techniques in the investigation and solution of technical problems. Assessing architecture and hardware limitation plans technical projects in the design and development of CAD software defines and selects new approaches and implementation of CAD software engineering application and design specification and parameters. They develop routines and utility programs also. prepares design specifications analysis and recommendations for presentation and approval may specify materials equipment and supplies required for completion of projects and may evaluate vendor capabilities to provide required products or services required technical and professional expertise like good knowledge of scripting languages like python tickle perl exposure to c c++ or other functional programming languages experience in different commercial tools good understanding in vlsi domain familiarity with standard software engineering practices for version control configuration management testing root cause analysis and quality assurance teamwork communication and problem solving skills in depth knowledge in data structure algorithms and optimizations for cad engineer it is advisable to gather as much as domain knowledge possible in the area of working sixth in the list is characterization engineer there can be various types of characterization in the entire vlsi arena at the very basic point characterization means to list out the electrical properties and or or associated physical properties associated 
connected with the circuit under concern. Now, by the nature of the circuit, whether it's digital, analog, I.O. or memory, the definition of respective job role is defined. For the characterization, there are generally industry standard simulation tools are there. If you are going for such a job role, you have to learn respective EDA software. For standard cell characterization, Cadence, Liberate or Synopsis, Silicon Smart are most popular to EDA tools. For memory characterization, whether you are designing a RAM, or ROM or NVM or any other memory, generally there are a lot of custom scripts combined with professional EDA tools which will be given to you. For such characterization jobs, strong fundamental knowledge of the respective circuit is required. Seventh job role is Silicon Test Chip Engineer. Test Chip is a functional miniature prototype of the ASIC chip under concern or the test chip could be a a test vehicle to test various design IPs of a IP design house. The test chip engineer has to be a jack of all trades. He or she must know all the steps from RTL to GDS to enhance the test chip engineer job role is challenging and highly rewarding. Eighth in the list is sign of engineer. You might come across the name sign of engineer. However, for you freshers, we would like to tell you that these positions are not for freshers. When you have at least 10 to 15 years of continuous experience, then only you can look towards this job. Well, we have discussed in a generic way about some popular job roles in PLSI. These are the very basic information, not in very much in-depth analysis. Do you actually know how much salary you will get as a fresher engineer in VLSI companies in India? Well, you have clicked the right video and I'll tell you your salary as a VLSI engineer with real-time data provided by real people. Skipping any part of this video will leave your knowledge incomplete. Choice is yours. Hey guys, welcome to Tech Simplified TV. We are discussing VLSI salaries for absolute fresher engineer right now. A fresher cost to company that is CTC in VLSI inside Indian subcontinent can range in between 3 lakh per annum to 10 lakh per annum. Wow, that's a very big range. Now, the question is, where do you lie in this entire range? I'm about to tell you that. But before that, I'll give you some more data that will clear your vision before going any further. The VLSI companies are broadly divided into two types of companies based on their outward delivery type. The first candidate is services-based company. These companies have trained engineer pool whose workforce are leveraged to the clients in exchange of money. The other candidate is product-based companies. These companies sell their soft or hard products to the semiconductor ecosystem or end user. For detailed category of the VLSI companies, please watch the video provided in the i button. Now, both the product and services companies subdivide the freshers with respect to their degree colleges. Tier 1 and Tier 2 are the gross subdivision of the degree colleges. Famous age-old colleges with a robust track record and IITs goes into the Tier 1 category. Rest come under the Tier 2 category. This Tier 1 and Tier 2 categorization has nothing to do with your academic record or specifically with you. Rather, this is because companies think that if we do not pay the lump sum to the candidate for tier 1, he or she might fly away to the competitor company. Now, let's come back to the salary data. I have taken these two polls in this YouTube channel and LinkedIn. Now, I will arrange the data into product, service, tier 1 and tier 2 categories. The two buckets under 6 LPA are paid by the services companies. Anything above 6 LPA is paid by product based companies. One disclaimer here, result may vary in your case. Let's categorize the CTCs in ascending order. Services companies gives 3 to 4 LPA to the tier 2 degree college students. Whereas they provide the 4 to 6 LPA for the tier 1 degree college students. The product companies give 6 to 8 LPA to the tier 2 degree college students, whereas they provide 8 to 10 LPA for the tier 1 degree college students. One disclaimer here, in case of exceptional track record and if it is a hot job, then you may bag some unexpectedly high packages. Now, all the realistic details are provided. Best wishes for you to enter into the VLSI arena and land into your dream job with right salary. 
If you are a fresher and aspiring to join VLSI industry, then this episode is just for you. So stay tuned till the end of this video. Since we are recovering from pandemic situation and gradually coming back to usual activities, on and off campus recruitments also started. So we decided to make one episode on essential topics a VLSI fresher must know. Any fresher usually face three types of screening. First, written. Second, few rounds of face-to-face -face interviews. And third is HR round. In today's episode, we will limit our discussion within core technical part. In written question paper, you will face aptitude questions and technical questions. Technical questions will cover both electronics and programming part. If you clear the written paper, you will be selected for multiple round of face-to-face -face interviews. In face-to-face, -face, mostly technical questions are asked. Here also we will face questions from core electronics part and programming part. Now let's see what are the topics you need to know. For core electronics part, first comes analog electronics. In analog electronics, you need to know basic structure, functioning, circuit behavior that is characteristics of different semiconductor devices like diode, zener diode, BJT, MOSFET, etc. Basic means structure, how current flows, how the device works. Now their characteristic part, their characteristics, different configuration of BJT and MOSFET is equally important. Circuit configuration and I IV plot, you might have to explain it on pen and paper to the interviewer. Now, op-amp is very important for interview purpose. Uses of op-amp is very common in interview questions. They might ask you to draw the circuit diagram and explain the operation of the circuit with input and output waveform. So, be prepared for that. All kinds of active and passive filters, their characteristics, circuit diagram, waveform are equally important. Then comes PLL circuit. The phase lock loop circuit is used as a curve generator in VLSI chips. Hence, the PLL circuit and its operation has grave importance in VLSI chips. So, you must be thorough in knowledge of design of a PLL up to the transistor level and you must understand its operation from the transistor perspective. Next comes digital electronics. Starting from number systems, Boolean algebra, logic gates, combinational circuits and sequential circuits, marks, decoder, latch, flip-flops, step machines, all types of memories, analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter and logic families like ECL, TTL, etc. are important. Memory includes RAM, ROM, SRAM, DRAM, EPROM, non-volatile memory, cache memory. You cannot afford to skip any topic from digital electronics, so be thorough in your preparation. In any of the topic, you must need to draw the diagram and explain. When you are studying the semiconductor memories, you must focus on the circuit operation, how a purely analog circuit helps to preserve an array of digital bits. You must also understand similarities and dissimilarities among RAM, ROM, EPROM, non-volatile memories, etc. When studying the non-volatile memories, you must also focus on the architectural difference between NAND and NOR arrangements of NVM. You must also know why these arrangements are compared to the NAND and NOR architecture. Third is VLSI fabrication process. Crystal growth, wafer preparation, oxidation, diffusion, ion implantation, lithography, epitaxy, etching, polysilicon dielectric film deposition, metallization, yield and reliability. These are the steps which are used to fabricate a chip. Hence, you need to cover all these topics. Following these things, you will also be able to draw stick diagram of couple of popular circuits you find in your textbook. These stick diagrams are very important if you are getting interviewed for opening in physical design or layout design team. Now, fourth is overview of VLSI design flow. You must know the name of the steps of a VLSI design flow. Since you are a fresher, deep knowledge is not expected. However, fundamentals must be thoroughly covered. You must know significance of each and every step. Your understanding must be very clear about how a step is connected to its previous and next steps. Try to know the name of some commercial tools used for each step. Now, fifth is CMOS circuit and logic design. In this section, questions are asked related to NMOS and PMOS operation and CMOS inverter, noise margin and CMOS operation. Understand the circuit and prepare to explain it with input and output waveform. You must also go through in the designs of NAND, NOR and etc. basic logic gates using the CMOS transistor circuit. 
those who are interested in digital designing may venture out in a bit more complex digital circuit like MUX, decoder, encoder using the CMOS transistor architecture. For each interview, while you are preparing, if you have job role and required skill set, study it carefully. Follow your own gut feeling in addition to the help provided in this video. Now, let's move to the programming part. From programming part or the coding part, you need to know C, C++ and data structure. Next is scripting languages like Perl, Python, Tickle, Shell scripting. This Perl, Python, Tickle and Shell are frequently used in VLSI flow. So, learn all of them. Parsing, flow automation development, report generation, data extraction all are done by scripting languages. While working with EDA tools, Tickle is most important. All the tool command written in Tickle. You can write wrapper in Tickle to run a tool. And third is basic Linux command. These are needed for day-to-day -day work. Well, detailed and in-depth series on Perl, Tickle, Bash scripting and Linux are available on our channel. Links are mentioned in the description box. Alternatively, you can go to the playlist page and find your relevant playlist. All these are topics you need to know for your interview. Once a company hire you, usually they will train you for the specific domain. Most companies have a structured training module. So keep learning, keep enjoying the process. If you are a new joinee, this video is just for you. Stay tuned till the end of the video. You have successfully cracked an interview. Actually not one. You got your job after long hours of preparation, then one written or online paper, a series of face-to-face -face interviews, each of them at least 40 minutes long, then HR interview. You received your appointment later. Congratulations, you made it. Now you are in your desk. Want to make impression? Definitely. So try to understand what is good for you and not so good for you. First, be punctual. Most of the offices have specific in or out time. Follow it. Make this good habit at the earliest stage of your career. For any scheduled event like training session, induction session, meeting, group discussion, show up 5 to 10 minutes earlier. And at the exact time, knock the door. Your punctuality will make good impression and it's important. It signifies that you respect the meeting and value the person or persons taking part in it. Second, align with your client or customer timings. Try to align with the timing of your client or customer or team. If you are in an internal project, team members are your daily go-to person, so try to align with their timing. If you are working with client, your timing must align with that of your client and that will increase productivity on daily basis. Let me give you an example. In one of my jobs, one of my client was from Japan. Their working hour starts when it's early morning in India. I used to reach my desk at 8.40 am to solve his issues first because while I am off for lunch, his office hours has ended or almost to end. We continued this way for few tape outs and did it successfully. Number 3. Be sure to carry your ID card or punch in card every day. Remember to carry your ID card or punch in card every day without any fail. It's a professional world and when they selected you, they found a sensible, sincere and deserving member of their team or organization in you. So behave likewise. Number 4. Timing for non-technical works. Use your time very judiciously. You are in office for official work, so give it priority. Usually, starting of the day is high energy time. Use it for your work. Give reply to all your important emails. Do follow-ups on work. Sometimes you need to do some non-technical work during the weekdays. So choose low energy time for non-technical works. If need to leave office, first talk to your manager and notify your team members also. Try to be back within time. Compensate the time later in the day. Otherwise, take half day leave if possible in either part of the day and complete your work. Number 5. One-on-one -on -one meetings with a manager. All managers do one-on-one -on -one meetings with their team members. How frequently it will take place is completely depends on your work culture of your company, on work pressure in your project and also on your manager. One-on-ones are actually good for you. It's a common platform for you and your manager to discuss technical and sometimes non-technical issues you are facing in the company. Always attend one-on-one. -on -one. Make a note of points you discussed. If your manager points to something you need to work on, definitely do that. In next one one, surely give an update to your manager. Number six, know who's who. Try to know about finance, IT system or facilities. Who's who? Take a note and stick a lookup table chart in your desk. Keep that desk number and if possible mobile number. Number seven, 
discuss non-technical issues. If you are facing some non-technical issues at office, don't keep on telling every other person. Call for a non-technical one-on-one with the manager and discuss. Be in a discussion mode and not in a complaining mode. Number eight, communication channel with manager. Keep your all communication channel open to your manager. Email both desktop and mobile, WhatsApp, SMS, etc. Number nine, break the barrier. Don't be shy. You have to break your barriers multiple times if needed. Ask question if you don't know it. There are something that is very specific to your office culture and search engine has no clue about it. Ask them who knows like HR, your manager and team members. If you are hesitant and thinking that people might laugh at you, always follow two rules. First, that if you do not ask the question, answer is always unknown to you. Second one is my motto of life and that is I don't know is acceptable as long as I want to know it. If you are unwilling to know, then you are a lost case. Number 10. Align with your team. Try to understand working style of your team and get used to it. Number 11. Avoid gossip. Avoid gossiping. It's tempting and easy to join. Still, we will recommend not to indulge in gossip. Have productive small chat. Number 12. Utilization of VNC or VPN. In case you have a remote working facility that is VNC or VPN, activate it through the manager. Don't use it until an emergency. Number 13. No work policy. Know your company's work policies very well. You are expected to know it and follow it. Number 14. Sexual harassment. Every company strictly follows sexual harassment policy. HR will tell you about it. Follow it strictly. You are now employee of that company and you are expected to treat your colleagues with dignity and respect. You might have good friendship with some of your colleagues. Still, maintain that limit while you are in casual chatting or exchanging thoughts. Be very specific in your comments. Don't make any comment that might have double meaning. 15. Taking leave. Leaves are part of your package. There is no harm in taking them. Don't take too much or too less leaves. Have a balance. Number 16. Take care of your health. Take good care of your health. And also, care of your food intake. Unhealthy food, lack of exercise and sitting jaw can ruin your health beyond repair. Number 17. Ergonomic backrest. Corporate jobs require long hours of sitting. Buy an ergonomic memory backrest. It's an investment for your future to save your spine for long run. Number 18. Take special care of your wardrobe. Dress properly. Casual college dressing is a big no-no here. First, know the dress code of your company. Dress accordingly. Some companies follow casual dress code. Even then, try to avoid t-shirt with very loud message or for girls, avoid dress which is too short or having plunging neckline. Number 19. Respect work from home policy. Many product companies will provide work from home facility to new joiners also. Respect it. Always be reachable by phone or email. Don't do anything other than official work in working hours. At this point, we will give two more tips. These two are actually my personal favorite. Number 20 is save 25%. This is related to financial one. When I was joining job, one of my professors suggested me to save 25% of what I earn. I always try to follow it. Enjoy your job and money. Buy whatever you have dreamed to buy and also don't forget to save. Your savings will save you one day. And the final one is learn something new every day. These tips I still follow. That was by one of my managers. I consider him as a teacher. His constructive criticism and encouragement helped me to overcome many barriers in my life. He suggested me to learn one thing every day, be it technical or non-technical. Try to learn something new every day, if not possible, at least once in a week, be it using a new word or learning something to cook or some new syntax. Follow this suggestion and see where you are after six months. Trust me, that made me a better person and I have achieved a lot personally and professionally. Well, we have listed all this based on our personal experiences. Hope it will help you in real life. During one of our live sessions, a viewer asked that what is the right amount of salary hike that he can expect as his first salary hike after starting his career as a VLSI engineer. If you have the same question in your mind or you want to verify whether your first hike was justified or not, then keep watching till the end of this video. Recently, we have posted two polls, one in LinkedIn and another in our YouTube community with same question, what was your first hike in VLSI? 
We have defined five different bands: five to seven percent, ten to fifteen percent, fifteen to twenty percent, twenty to twenty-five percent, and twenty-five to thirty percent. Along with first hike, we will give a general overview of high percentage buckets and probable results of them. This analysis is based on our experiences, discussion we had with our colleagues on different occasions, and real-time examples. As usual, we are not mentioning any name. Let's come to the first bucket that is 5 to 7% hike. There might be few scenarios where your hike is less than 10%. First, if you are a product company fresher and your company has earned less annual profit in current financial year compared to the last financial year. Another scenario is that you are a product company employee and working in a stable project for long time and there is very little growth in the project. Many times, project cross their development phase and in turn maintenance phase with little to no development cycle. In such scenario, high could be less than 10%. Another scenario is that you have joined a service-based company as a trainee and after completing training, received your employee status just 4 to 6 months back. Since during major part of the financial year, you were under training, don't expect more than 10% high. Another scenario for service company is that you are an experienced employee and joined a service company with very good hike. Unless your project has exceptional growth, your hike is less than 10%. Now, we will talk about 10 to 15% hike bucket. The realistic scenarios could be you are a product company employee and your company had a moderate to low profit in last financial year. If you are in a service-based company, probably you are a senior engineer and have made significant contribution in the project. Since your base salary is quite high, 10 to 15% of that is a good amount. The third scenario could be irrespective of service or product company. You can get 10 to 15% hike when there is a similar opening in competitive companies. You are a senior member of the team and a key contributor in the project. Overall, in this scenario, your company doesn't want to lose you. Now let's move to the 15 to 20% hike bucket. 15 to 20% hike is basically mid-band hike. For freshers, there is not much to complain. Your manager might give you a review saying there is much to improve, so keep learning. For experienced engineers, since base level is higher, 15 to 20% of that is not at all bad. Next is 20-25% hike bucket. This is the great hike bucket. If you have received that, first throw a party. You are doing good. Your contribution is getting noted. Your manager and skip level managers are satisfied with your performance. Keep up doing good work. Continue to learn more and enjoy the journey. Your project has long roadmap with excellent growth. You are a key member and your company doesn't want to lose you to competitor companies. The above scenario is same for service and product based companies. Now let's move to the final bucket that is 25 to 30% bucket. Now the highest bucket 25 to 30%. You can call it jackpot bucket. During every appraisal cycle, you will hear rumors like that company has given more than 55% hike, that team member has received 60% hike. Mostly these are rumors as grass is always greener on the other side. There are exceptions yet 25 to 30% hike is jackpot. Keep doing the good work. How much dissatisfied your manager appears in 101, the salary revised later doesn't lie. Again, we will say keep up doing the good work. All the analysis of 20 to 25% hike bucket is much more appropriate for this bucket also. Wait, you you can expect more than 30% hike also. Let's discuss the scenarios. We did not post this option in our poll, although this kind of hike can occur in reality. This kind of hike you can expect when you are making a switch from service to product based company, smaller service company to bigger service company, smaller product company to bigger product company, from one country to another country as job location, any job switch packed with promotion in job grid. Whatever post you are in, keep learning. How to assess your progress? Check every 6 months to 1 year whether you could add at least quarter to half page to your resume. If the answer is yes, obviously your learning curve is great. Learn as much as possible. That learning will help you to get good projects be it in your present company or some other company. That is much for today. We have came across a question quite frequently regarding the configuration of desktop or laptop required for a semiconductor aspirant or a fresher. If you have same question in your mind, stay tuned till the end of the video. When an engineering student is planning to join semiconductor industry, he or she needs to learn few things. These are basically mandatory for all semiconductor aspirants, irrespective of front end or back end. To gain some hold on all these topics, a student need practice and a laptop on desktop with proper configuration so that some free tools and software run on it. Today we will discuss about it. Now let's see what are absolutely necessary to learn. Linux, 
scripting languages like Perl, Tickle, Shell, Python, Verilog or VHDL, Spice and Timing Tool. When you are preparing to enter VLSI or EDA domain or just have joined the industry, you must gather some domain knowledge along with going deeper into the work you are doing. You might be selected for backend although a little bit of knowledge in Verilog or VHDL will actually help you. Those who are not able to figure out how to start preparation for VLSI while doing engineering course or have a confusion how to choose between frontend and backend, we would suggest go ahead and watch videos on this Talk. We have already made videos on these topics. Link of the videos are provided in the description. You will understand what we are saying. There are free tools which can help you to kickstart your VLSI journey. These tools are free and very efficient for learning purpose. We have made a video on these free tools. You can get the whole list and why those tools are used from this video. Here we will discuss what should be the system requirement to install all these free tools. Now let's move to the core of the topic. First, Linux. Most of the desktop or laptop comes with pre-installed license version of Windows OS. Whereas you need to learn Linux, you can use VirtualBox to install Linux in a Windows laptop or desktop. Let's understand what is VirtualBox and what system configuration required for VirtualBox. Oracle VM VirtualBox is a cross-platform virtualization software. It allows users to extend their existing computer to run multiple operating systems including Microsoft Windows, Mac OS X, Linux and Oracle Solaris at the same time. System configuration for VirtualBox VirtualBox run on Intel and AMD processors. It can be installed on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, Solaris and FreeBSD. On VirtualBox, you can run VMs with Windows, Linux, Mac OS, Solaris, FreeBSD, Novel, Netware and other operating systems. A processor with virtualization technology is necessary for VirtualBox. Most of the processors nowadays come with pre-enabled virtualization technology. For high performance and multi-virtual systems, a multi-core processor is required with at least 4 cores as a minimum requirement. 8 cores are recommended for multiple virtual systems. Minimum 4 GB RAM is required for virtualization. If the RAM is less, the process will become slow or unusable. 8 GB is recommended for running a single virtual machine at a time. 8 GB RAM is required to run more than a single virtual machine at the same time. A minimum of 20 GB GB storage is required to each virtual machine. 50 GB is recommended to use the virtual machine for a long time. Nowadays, SSD hard drives are available. Although costly, this loads the OS and the software is very fast. So we would suggest you to have SSD from the very beginning for your laptop or desktop. Second, scripting languages. Scripting languages like Perl, Tickle, Shell, Python are one of the most essential thing you need to know. It's basically the communication language in VLS world. All the tools are enabled operated using scripting languages. To understand or to debug, you need to know the syntax of the languages. These are very light on system resources. For Perl, Tickle, Python, you can install interpreter in Windows and run. We have already made tutorial series on Perl, Tickle and Shell. Installation and the Hello World program are demonstrated in episodes. Relevant video link is provided in description. Number 3. Verilog. For Verilog, Vivado and Icarus Verilog Simulator are the most popular free tools. Vivado is proposed by Xilinx. We have an entire series on Verilog and link is mentioned in the description box. We have discussed about these two free tools in the video Best Kept VLSI Secret. Installation and Hello World program video of Vivado and Icarus Verilog are also there. Links are mentioned in the description. Vivado is comparatively resource hungry software and so we would recommend 8GB RAM and SSD hard drive here also. Number 4 Spice. P Spice and LT Spice are popular and free Spice simulator. These are also not system hungry tools. So system configuration suitable for virtual box is sufficient for them. Next come timing tool. For timing and Analysis, we would recommend Open Timer. We have already made tutorial video on that. It's not a resource hungry software, so whatever system configuration we have recommended for VirtualBox is sufficient for Open Timer. As an overall system requirement, you must need a latest generation CPU either from Intel or from AMD, 8 GB of RAM, 500 GB of SSD hard drive, and preferably a beginner level graphics card for your desktop or laptop. The need 
assignment of the GPU is for the upcoming VLSI tools which use multi-core technologies and club the CPU core as well as GPU cores. And once you graduate, more and more VLSI tools will join the bandwagon of utilizing GPU. Hope this episode will help you. Want to land on your dream company, but you don't know their work culture and salaries? How do you check all this info even before you have your first interview with them? Stay tuned till the end of the video to know all the answers. Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are going to explore one particular website that is very very professional and help you in your professional life. Either you are a beginner or you are a experienced person. This website will be very very much needed when you are looking for a job change. So let me demonstrate the glass door. We type Glassdoor in the Google and we hit enter and here you can see it has opened up the Glassdoor.co.in. So you can see the Glassdoor.co.in has opened and today the section we will be mostly covering is this one, the company reviews. Other sections you can go and visit from here and uh, in course of action today we will be mostly exploring this thing because when you getting a job offer from a company, you do not know about the company, you do not know about their salaries, you do not know about their work culture you do not know how the HR perquisites or which is abbreviated as parks are given to you. Actually you are in a state of wondering about everything and you are trying to reach out to people but you do not know whom to talk and where to get the informations right. This website the glass door that helps you in this fashion. This website actually also offer jobs that means it do not give you jobs in glass door but it enlists all the jobs of a particular company in the particular company profile. So a let us begin the journey here. Let me open the companies and reviews section. So I have already created my login in the Glassdoor. For you, you have to create your login. You can just enter with your Google email ID. That's all. And you may have to write one particular company review that you can write in a very short and sweet manner. I have just done that already long, long ago. So I am not able to do that right now in front of you. But for your information, I have shared it. Now, let us see what are there. Here you can see we have jobs tab, we have companies tab, we have salaries tabs and we have careers tab. Here there are four tabs and let me show you one thing. Here you have one particular search box where you can search a company name that either you are getting a job offer or it's your dream company you want to join that particular company and you want to search about it. Let me first since we are in the VLSI arena and one of very renowned company is Xilinx. So let us try with the name Xilinx here. I am searching otherwise if you can see that multiple companies are enlisted here you can go search by them in, in case you are not a particular VLSI person or in case you are pursuing a career in your software, you can go ahead and click these companies and proceed. Obviously, the method I am going to demonstrate in this video will be same for VLSI as well as non-VLSI companies. So, this is a generic format. So let me type Xilinx. So, I have typed Xilinx and you can see I have hit enter and the Xilinx has came here. You can see Xilinx logo here and it has been acquired by AMD so it's there. Now as the page opens up, what things you have immediately in front of you, you look here, there are several tabs. Here is the overview which is open by default. Then we have the reviews. Then we have the job listing means you can apply for a job from here. That is the beauty of this site. It contains bouquet of things all together for a particular company. Here you can see the salaries you can have a chit chat about the salaries you can see how much salaries are here you can go in this particular tab to get about the interview question rounds what are there here you can see about the benefit that means the monetary benefits that you get under the CTC that is the cost to company here you can see the basic divisions of the salary as well as the perquisites here you can see about the photos and uh, it's about the diversity so mostly here as a fresher you will be focusing on interviews reviews and jobs okay rest of the things if you are a maybe experienced person then you might explore the salaries okay and the benefits Benefits because at that time when you are experienced you know about the benefits and all and you will interpret these two things so let's start so here you can see here it's a company right so here you can see its overview right size how many employees are there how much revenue it earns okay and what is the website and what is the headquarters and it is founded in 84 that is 1984 another beautiful thing since you are in the PLSI field right uh, you can see the competitors right who are the competitor companies who compete with them so these are the business competitors so in case you want to move from 
one particular company to another particular company so in that case you can move to any competitor company so here you can see the competitor so you can see here the xilinx reviews it has a very good review you can see ceo's names and ratings and here you can see all these details right now let me go back to the top let's go one by one into the tabs first we go to the review step here we click and here we reach the review step so here you can see found 723 over 1 reviews with terra if i scroll here you can see awesome place and someone has written it and there are also complaints about the companies you can see here here you can see the complaints someone has written here you can see multiple good and bad reviews of the company you can uh, go ahead and uh, read them by yourself so you can move in this section by next page and next page by this you have several reviews so you can go ahead and explore the review step by yourself you are hesitant so you are hesitant about entering a company whether it is a good company whether it's a bad company whether its culture is good or culture is bad all those things you will get here okay how the management is how how the salaries are have been revised or if there is a change inside the company what has happened in the last change here if i go to the next steps here you can see 32 job postings is here so let me click and go to the jobs button here the xilinx jobs are listed here you can choose your relevant job role you are searching for in case you are a job hunter and you are a situation where you are desperately hunting for a job this particular tab will be helpful for you in that particular game okay so you can see several jobs are posted here right you have to go and explore the jobs and you have to check whether your skill sets are matching or not now the job tab has been discussed now let's move on to the salary step so the salary is it's very important because when you are trying to join any company whatever the package the hr will offer to you you must have a clear idea about that so where you can get such idea in advance so this is the tab so let me click on the salary step and the salary step here it has opened right so there are categories right engineering business and other all these uh, sub categories you can go ahead and check about the salaries their ranges their benefits and all and if you scroll down you can see right if you are senior software engineer how much you are getting software engineer how much you are getting as a intern how much you are getting so obviously these values vary from one country to another country so check for the country and you must visit the locations here you can see here these salaries from all the location okay so for a intern if you are looking for the exact location details means the different geographical offices right you go here and you will see here the details you will get a rough idea about the salaries here for different job roles and from that you can have a idea that whatever the hr is offering to you whether that is at par the company level and as per your expectation this is a realistic area where you can set your realistic expectations about the ctc that you must get when you enter the particular company with a particular job role so here we are done the next is interviews so this is the section whether you are a pressure or you are a experienced person so that time you will get benefited from the interview so here interviews and if you scroll down right here it says about different job role interviews so here it's a product engineer intern interview how it went and how people are sharing their experience so you can go ahead and scroll down and you can find out different experiences what people have experience they have shared you will see both good and the bad my suggestion is that you get the crux that means if a good situation is faced by you what you will do and if a bad situation is faced by you what you will do so all these things you can get prepared that means way ahead the actual interview from this particular tab so if you even move pages after pages you will get lot of information here about the interviews now the next section is benefits benefits is a section if you read it as a fresher you will understand what the different ctc breakdowns are there and what else that means what are the hr perquisites that you will receive which is apart from the salary apart from the monthly salary what benefits you get from a company so here if i scroll down right here you can see a summary 
whatever extra benefit that you are getting right these things will prepare you and advance when the hr talks about the etc and the hr parks that is the perquisites so here you can see different people have responded and written their responses about the different uh, benefits and all so here you can see either a five star or four star so these are the realistic things which people have anonymously written people generally write here anonymously no one clears their name but they share their experience right and if you go page after page you will get all these things okay now the next two tabs are right now very much less important because these are company photos i'll not scroll there because these are their own uh, proprietary photos and they are this diversity so what type of uh, company and the diversity is there so it is expected so here today let me summarize here so what we have talked about the most important sections are these the reviews the jobs the salaries the interviews and the benefits so all these things you will get about a particular company here we have picked one company xilinx and you can choose the company which is your dream company either or any company that is offering you a job that means you have cleared the interview or you have just received a call from the hr that a interview will begin with that particular company so about that company you can do your research here so even now there is a question in the hr round why you want to join a particular company so that also you can get from here but one thing please do not mention the name of this particular website when you are talking to the hr rather you say we have just learned it from the internet here we are done this is the company step i am opening again where we have started so today we have just discussed about the different tabs and different options inside the glass door you can log in here with your google id that means the google gmail id you don't have to do anything else and when you are entering you may get asked to write a review about your previous company you can write something about your previous company it may be a company or it may be something that a institute or something so you can write about that and uh, then you can proceed in this particular uh, site and you can find many things what you are looking for i think we are done here hello and welcome to the ninth episode of q a we are having very important question covered in today's episode regarding your application towards an internship or a job in vlsi industry viewer hariyom shukla has asked that sir i am filing for internship and jobs in various companies but not getting any call back so in today's episode we will zoom into the situation which you may face also stay tuned till the end of this episode to know how to deal with such situation in a professional and assertive way welcome back in today's episode we are discussing about a common question that is i am applying for a job or internship but i am not getting any call backs why so we will go in depth answer to this question before that i will advise first you shift the focus from yourself and move the focus on to the post that you have applied now you are in the position to understand and deal with the situation in a perfect rational manner the question being discussed here is very simple looking at first but the answer is not that much simple to get the answer you have to go through multiple layer of thought level when you apply to a internship or a job in a particular job portal or linkedin first you have to consider that it is a virtual platform that means it is a virtual reality there is no person sitting in front of you who can immediately respond back this is a very human to human interaction you are expecting right now but there are multiple non human layers between you and the recruiter now let us discuss these non human layers in detail in many of the cases the recruiter will post the internship or job across various platforms such as a bunch of job portals and in linkedin now the matter of fact is that the person who is posting in so many site cannot remain simultaneously connected to all of them this creates the gap in the communication between you and the recruiter here the communication is indirect communication which you are assuming to be a direct one now let me tell you what happens the recruiter has to separately log on to each site in which he or she has posted then manually he or she has to collect all the data from each site and process the entire stack of data collected from each of the website this is a tedious task and hence it is causing another level of gap followed by unintended delay 
Now let's park the car onto your side by driving away from the recruiter side. The question to solve now is what can be done to deal with such situation by your action. Let us solve the clogging caused due to the mentioned gap by taking a detour. When you face such situation, the first thing you should do that you should directly connect to the recruiter who has posted in any of the social media or in the job portal. To do so, you connect to the person directly through social media such as LinkedIn. Once you are connected, now you have an opportunity to have a chat with him over the social media regarding your application process. On the other hand, when you have the email ID of the recruiter, your approach becomes more formal. You can send an email asking for the progress status. You can do a follow-up in every 15 days period in case you have not received any answer. If you have got any answer, then you must use your intelligence to respond formally and professionally. Now let us move on to the next stage. This is the case of the convergence in case of a positive interaction. Remember that convergence is a two-way street. Let me explain how. Now, when you reach the recruiter through social media or through email, he or she may also ask what you are expecting and within what timeline. So, you must be very much prepared for such situation. When both sides have the same expectation at the same level, convergence happens very soon. You are expecting to get on board in next 6 months and the recruiter also have the same timeline. Then both of you are in highly probable to converge within the next 6 months. The second case here the recruiter is expecting a person on board by next 2 months and you have a much larger window available from your side. In this case also both of you are highly probable to converge. Now, let us talk about the divergence case. The third case, if the recruiter is expecting a person to onboard after 8 to 10 months while you have your window closing within next 4 months, both of you will eventually diverge from each other. Until now, all the discussion that I have had with you were completely at the superficial level, that is on skin depth. Now, let me give you a more broader and in-depth perspective of the scenario. When a post of internship or job is posted in any of the job site or in social media, generally that particular post is linked with a project in the corresponding company. Such projects have a definite timeline of roadmap for 3 to 5 years down the line. The beginning and ending of the project is like a time window. This time window may get shifted in the future by few more months than it was originally planned for and hence the post was opened. Let us take an example. The post is opened in January. It get pushed back by 7 months due to some circumstances in the respective company. Now the situation is beyond your control. So you cannot do anything from your side other than waiting. So I would like to suggest you to stop wondering or speculating. Start a conversation with the recruiter to understand the present situation. However, one thing I would like to emphasize that the post of the project has not been scrapped yet. The position which was posted will be still alive on the social media or the job portal until a person is hired for that particular position. One more thing I would like to mention that in case of a particular project commence date is very near then you will see that hiring will be done on war footing step and you will get no relaxation maybe in between multiple rounds of the interview. So now let us come to the final question. After applying for a post, how long should I wait in the waiting room? The answer is you must do a follow up in every 15 days. Now how to reach out to the recruiter I have already mentioned. One thing I would like to mention that your text or email response must be professional and formal. It should not appear that the other person you are pushing him or her for your own goal. Rather, it should appear that you are very eager to join the post. Maintain this theme of conversation from the beginning till the end. Also, I would like to advise you that you should apply multiple application 
at various positions of various companies spread across the multiple job portals and LinkedIn. Nowadays, a lot of Telegram or WhatsApp job groups are there. Here, the jobs are posted regularly by the recruiters. Do search for such job groups and join them. I would like to conclude now. Using all the methods in today's episode, you will be able to deal with the situation in the real world as well as inside your mind. It is all about managing your thought process and the real-time process with a perfect balance. We have come to the end of this episode. Are you working as an IT professional and want to join VLSI or semiconductor industry? Then this video is just for you. Stay tuned till the end of the video. In today's Q&A session, we will be addressing a frequently asked question that how can I change domain from software or IT to VLSI? Getting a desired job is all about matching between required skill set for the post and expertise or experience of the applicant. Now, VLSI or semiconductor industry is predominantly a domain for people having electronics background. However, there are significant scope for people from computer science background also. For example, R&D teams of EDA companies require people from computer science background. In many IP companies, CAD team is completely run by people who are from computer science background. Moreover, system team, shipping and delivery team require people with strong programming skill. If you are working in IT or software background for quite some time and want to join VLSI or semiconductor industry, then first thing you must do is that try to understand where you stand with your skill set with respect to required skill set that you can do by keeping a close eye on published job openings in different job portal or professional networking site. Try to understand the JD to find out which kind of skill set is required. If you have those skill set, then congrats. Half of the work is done. If you lag in skill set, don't get upset. Make a plan to acquire those skill set. For domain knowledge of front end or back end or to know about the basics of different steps of VNSI flow, you may join some finishing school and after completion of the course, you will get a certificate. Try to gather some domain knowledge. You might aim to join any R&D team of an EDA company where you will contribute to develop an EDA tool. A little bit generic knowledge on how that tool will impact a customer customer's work or where actually in the VLSI flow it is used will help you during the interview. You can find one sample JD on the screen. This sample JD is collected from a job portal. From both the desired skill and qualification section, you can get an initial idea about the job role. For this opening, the company is looking for a person with degree of computing discipline and with relevant knowledge. This is a typical job opening for people with computing background and almost all product companies need such people. There is another sample JD on the screen. This is a JD for EDA tool developer and they even looking for a person with proven industry experience of 5 years. So there are openings. One need to follow such openings and prepare themselves accordingly. Now once your preparation part is done, rewrite your resume and upload to multiple job portals. Also search for jobs on professional networking sites and apply. Hope today's discussion will be helpful for you. We want to say all the best in advance and want to sign off for today. Hey guys, welcome to the Tech Simplified TV. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the impact of artificial intelligence in VLSI. We will talk about various zones of VLSI where the AI can provide awesome solutions. Wait, wait, would you be happy or insecure when you think about intrusion of AI into the VLSI industry? Stay tuned till the end of this episode to know the answer. Welcome back. We are talking about the AI in VLSI. The question that is sticking in your mind, should I feel happy or insecure about AI entering into the VLSI industry? Well, you can be pessimistic that you feel you will become redundant by the intrusion of AI or you can feel optimistic that AI will empower you as VLSI engineer. In both the cases, I will call you as an extremist. So, let's have a view somewhere in between. This is called the realistic view. It is the rational way of welcoming 
learning any new thing. Now, let's come to the fact in which areas of the BNSI, the AI actually can fortify the industry. Can you answer which are the areas in BNSI that requires a lot of iteration on a single step again and again and again. Thus, it slows down the productivity and the turnaround time. There are many such areas exist in the front end and the back end of the entire async design flow, also known as the RTL to GDS2 flow. Front end verification is a complex area in terms of coverage every new tech format. No matter how rigorous you do, you will still need some leftover untouched scenario. This might be a headache for any verification engineer. The AI can help in this particular sector using its intelligence to cover all the scenarios. Now, when we talk about VLSI, generally designs are incrementally changed over the time. This incremental change can be with respect to the fabrication technology. Like you are going from higher technology node towards the lower technology node. The incremental change can also come from changing some architecture of a particular design block for increasing the overall performance. This way, the incremental changes and their consequences may be tackled by the AI engine. It can use the past knowledge in form of known problem and solution scenarios or it can access the knowledge base repository. From all these database, it can develop its own intelligence over the time. Let me tell you how an AI will work here before going any further. The setup of the engine will be different from our present software installation. The AI need loads of data samples because to have a broader perspective to develop its own intelligence. Hence, the AI has to operate from a cloud and not from a local desktop PC. This cloud obviously stay inside a single company and not like the real cloud in the sky which keeps floating around here and there. In a MNC, generally the designs are made through multi-site collaborative operation. So, the cloud and the AI software together will have multiple feeds from the multiple human brains working across multiple sites. It will also have the access to the databases of all past cases of concerned groups working together in the same project. This way, the AI will learn how to deal with a difficult situation and at the same time, it will be ready for the unprecedented situation lying in near or far future. However, human interventions will be much needed to segregate between the relevant or irrelevant addition from the AI engine. The next section I am talking about is the VLSI backend, where the criticality and the iterations are much more as compared to its front-end counterpart. This is because at this level, we are entering into the layout. Now, here the AI can play a good part based on the past experiences, whether it is coming from the knowledge base or it is coming from the various engineers who have worked on the cloud as I have mentioned earlier. With the AI, issues and challenges in various stages of the PNR will be resolved at a faster pace. Rectification or preventive rectification for various physical verification faults will be tackled much faster. Now, at this stage, the intervention of a human being is a must because the design has to go on to silicon. And it's nothing like the software industry where we can release a software patch to tackle any raid or yellow flag happening on the customer end. In VLSI industry, we cannot release a patch on the final silicon chip already out in the consumer market. So, you can understand that as a VLSI engineer, you are not in a threatened condition because at the end of the day, the sanctity of the analysis on the correction made by the AI engine has to be doubly verified with human interpretation and intervention. The next stage impacted by AI is the static timing analysis. In a multi-million gate chip, there will be lot of STA violations. Some will be false alarms. AI can easily root out these false alarms. Rest of the unnecessary what if then cases, the AI can simulate with its own brain. Rest of the multi-level necessary changes will be clearly presented by the AI engine towards the VLSI engineer. One more thing, IR drop, hotspot management, multi-PVT, multi-OCB layout verification will be like a breeze with the AI being in the VLSI arena. Now, let's move our focus 
focus to other areas of the VLSI design where the AI will have impact. In analog design, simulation of the analog circuits require a lot of runtime in multiple days. Sometimes these hours a week or a month based on the design size. To some extent, these runtime challenges have been improved in recent times by usage of fast spice, accelerated spice or GPU enamored spice etc. When we have a cloud and AI in the place for the analog VLSI industry, we will continue the analog simulations to the AI engine and the cloud together. The killer combination of this duo will have the access to all of the past cases, all their simulation data, all their problems and solutions. So having all that data bank in the brain, the AI engine will be able to simulate large analog designs in almost no times. Now let us focus on the next area where the AI will have a major impact. This is none other than the standard cell design and characterization. The standard cell domain has a huge amount of manpower involved in the rigorous cell development and verification for the various views across multiple cell type, PVT, EVA vendor, etc. With the help of the AI, all of these can be streamlined with efficiency and lesser iteration. VLSI engineer working in the standards and design and characterization domain will be very much happy to release one version of the entire standards cell library in a very short time. Any customization of the library as a part or as a whole for the specific customer will become much easier to cater. The next trending area that will have a huge impact is the analog mix signal simulations. In this domain, the setup of analog and digital together itself is a cumbersome process. Sometimes this setup takes a long time because the fundamental mismatch between various digital and analog blocks inside the entire design. Mismatch of ports declaration is very common, insertion of A2D or D2A and many such other boundary converters is a cumbersome process. The AI can take care of these things in a very easy way. As I already mentioned that the analog simulation will run faster once it will come under the hood of the AI, obviously the weak signal simulation will finish in an wink and of eye. Well guys, I would like to conclude here.